Hello everybody, this is Dr Christopher White and in this presentation we're going to continue looking at earthquakes and the Earth's interior. So in this video we're going to be thinking about how do earthquakes cause damage and this is going to correspond to section 12.7 of your textbook. So we know that when an earthquake occurs we're going to produce our two types of seismic waves, body waves and surface waves. Now the body waves aren't actually that much of a threat to people because they'll go down into the Earth's interior where they'll, be, where, where they'll dissipate. It's the surface waves that are the most dangerous because these are obviously going to move across the Earth's surface and they're going to cause the ground to either rise and fall or to move from side to side and it's this movement that's actually going to cause the damage. Now you can see here we have a diagram that shows you a settlement located along a coastal plain. Now you can see we have an area of elevated terrain here, we have the coastal plain itself here, there's the coastline, we have a river coming off the high ground, and we have an ocean basin over here. Now we can see that running along here we have a fault rupture, and so we know that there's a fault running along this line right here. Now it's a bit difficult to tell exactly what kind of fault it is but just looking at the way this diagram is being drawn it would suggest that this grey black rock here is being thrust over the top of this material here so it looks like it might be a thrust fault but that's by no means certain. Anyway so we have ourselves a rupture right here and of course this rupture is going to be produced when fault movement occurs. So when fault movement occurs you can see we've ended up with the formation of this scarp here and so first of all if you happen to have a house built right where this rupture occurs well you're in a lot of trouble your house is going to get quite badly damaged. There's also the problem that the formation of this scarp is going to create an area of elevated terrain. Elevated terrain will naturally weather more quickly than lower terrain in typical conditions. And so this means that you're going to have lots of loose sediment being produced by the erosion of the scarp here. And so that means you have an increased risk of problems such as landslides associated with the presence of the rupture. Now, the shaking of the ground will also cause pre-existing deposits of loose sediment to slide. And so it's not uncommon for earthquakes to lead to landslides. And of course, landslides can very often be more damaging than the earthquake itself. So, you know, the earthquake might shake your building a little bit, you know, it might damage your building to a relatively minor degree. But you might think, I'm out of the woods here, everything's gone relatively okay. However, the earthquake can cause landslides and it's the movement of landslides which can actually produce substantial damage because if a landslide comes sweeping down a river valley, anything in its path is going to get very, very badly damaged. So landslides are a risk, especially in areas of elevated terrain where there tends to be a lot of very loose, poorly consolidated sediment. So think of a situation like the Himalayas, lots of erosion, lots of loose sediment, the capacity for big earthquakes to occur. When a large earthquake does occur, it's not too much of a surprise that these earthquakes can trigger very substantial landslides, which are extremely damaging. Now, the most common type of damage that we get from earthquakes is, of course, structural damage, because buildings by their very nature are normally designed to be rigid. They don't really want to move that much. Otherwise, your building would sway every time the wind blew. You don't want that. Now, the problem is, though, is that when the ground which your building is sitting on starts to go up and down or from side to side, well, your building can't really respond to that movement because, remember, it's rigid. And so what will happen is it's not uncommon for your building to be damaged. It will start to crack as a way of accommodating the movement. That's all it can do because it's going to behave in a brittle fashion. And so structural damage is very, very common in areas that are prone to earthquakes. Now, typically, the more poorly constructed your building is, the more likely it is to fail during an earthquake. So this normally means that over time, as building standards have become more rigorous, the quality of the building is going to be higher. And therefore, if you live in a new building, providing it's been well constructed, it should do better in an earthquake compared to an older building, which may not have been constructed under quite such rigorous standards. So typically, the lower the quality of the construction, the worse the damage will be. 
So normally countries which tend to uh, be slightly richer can afford better quality buildings. And so very often if an earthquake strikes a, a country that has a, a relatively strong economic position, the amount of damage done will often be reduced due to the fact that the buildings are better constructed. In contrast, when you have a large earthquake striking an area where building standards are relatively low, this can lead to substantial numbers of building failures and this can lead to very substantial loss of life. So typically, the more poorly constructed the buildings are, the more likely they are to fail during an earthquake and therefore the more dangerous they will be. Now, during earthquakes, it's not uncommon for more loosely consolidated material to move due to the shaking. So think of a situation where you have a, a cubic meter of jello and a cubic meter of granite. So you walk up to the cubic meter of jello and you punch it on one side. Well, that's going to cause the jello to move. So essentially you're imparting force into the jello and the jello is moving in response to that. The same thing will happen with loosely consolidated sediment as the seismic waves pass through, the loosely consolidated sediment will move in response to the surface waves. In contrast, you walk up to the cubic meter of granite and you punch it, there's a chance you might break your knuckles. The granite's not going to respond, it's too solid, it's too robust. And so typically the more poorly consolidated your material is, and sediments are particularly bad for this, the more likely they are to move in response to an earthquake. So there is, it's not uncommon to have a situation where you have bridges which have been built over rivers. And if they don't put the piles for the bridge support deep enough, then as the sediment moves, it will cause essentially the, uh, the bridge to fail. So that's why if you ever you know, go into architecture and decide to build bridges, you really want to drive the piles all the way down into the bedrock, which is under the sediment, because that's solid. So if an earthquake occurs, the bridge will be less likely to fail. In contrast, if you only drive the piles down into the sediment and the sediment starts moving, well, that means your bridge is therefore going to very quickly become weakened due to an earthquake and may well collapse. So the next risk associated with earthquakes is liquefaction of fill. Now, liquefaction occurs when you have a clastic sediment which is waterlogged. So it contains the maximum amount of water possible in the pore spaces between the clasts. Now, under normal circumstances, the sediment is going to appear to be solid. And this is because the clasts are in direct contact with each other. So if you apply a force to the sediment, like you push down it with your hand, the clasts are naturally going to push against each other. So they're going to offer some resistance. So the sediment is going to feel quite hard and firm. Now in that situation, you're going to think to yourself, okay, this is good. I can put my building here. The material I'm building on is quite solid. Now, during liquefaction, what happens is, is your sediment behaves like a liquid. The reason for this is there's a change in fluid pressure in your sediment. So as we've said, the sediment is absolutely waterlogged. It's got the maximum amount of water in it it possibly can. Now, as the pressure wave, pressure wave, should I say, from the earthquake move through the sediment, what they do is they change the fluid pressure in the sediment. And this change in fluid pressure can cause it to increase. And this increased fluid pressure forces the water along the contacts between the clasts. So now the clasts are no longer in contact with each other. They're separated from one another by a very thin layer of water. So as soon as this happens and your class are no longer in direct contact with each other, well, that means there's no, no longer going to be any resistance to stress. So if you were to put your hand on the sediment, your hand would sink into it. It would behave like a fluid. So imagine you've built your building on this sediment thinking it's solid and then all of a sudden an earthquake happens, the water injects itself in between the class and all of a sudden your solid sediment turns into a material that behaves like a liquid. Well, naturally your building is going to sink or it's going to subside at the very least. So liquefaction is a very uh, common problem, especially in environments when you have, where you have a lot of waterlogged sediment. Now, the final risk associated with earthquakes are, of course, tsunamis. And tsunamis are caused at ocean-ocean and ocean-continent convergent plate boundaries. Now, tsunamis are the result of changes in the level of the seafloor. And we're actually going to cover this in greater detail in another lecture. So I'm just going to cover it very briefly now.
So what happens during the, gen uh, during the generation of a tsunami is that you have an area of the seafloor which gets pushed up. Obviously, as this area of the seafloor gets pushed up, it displaces the water above it. And so this displaced water has to go somewhere. And so one of the ways the water can go is towards the land. And so this displaced water, let's say there's a piece of oceanic crust that gets pushed up over here, it displaces the water above it, and that pushes a wave of water towards the coast, and this can lead to a tsunami forming. So, as you can see, there are lots and lots of risks associated with earthquake activity. And of course, this can lead to the kind of destruction that we can see here. Here we can see a parking garage that's clearly collapsed. You can see that even though these pillars seem to be reinforced with steel, they clearly weren't you know, well constructed enough to survive the force of the earthquake. And we can see the same thing here. We can see in this case, the building has uh, been shaken to the point where the walls have failed. And you can actually see the building is quite clearly leaning. Now, arguably, the, the worst danger from an earthquake is actually the aftershocks. So normally what happens is, is an earthquake will occur and then following the earthquake in the next few days and weeks, there will often be numerous smaller earthquakes that occur along the, you know, in the same area of the fault. Now, this might not sound too bad, but if the first earthquake causes significant damage, well, any subsequent earthquakes, even if they're smaller, can make that damage worse. And so there have been incidents where a large earthquake has occurred, rescuers have moved into the area to try and help people who are in trouble, and then there's been an aftershock. And of course, because the area is already damaged, there's lots of damaged buildings. When the aftershock hits, it causes buildings to collapse and it causes the people who are there to rescue the residents of the area to also become trapped and risk their lives as well. So aftershocks are another very significant risk associated with earthquake activity. So what destruction can happen after an earthquake has occurred? So we've already discussed how a lot of the damage is going to be structural. You're going to have lots of damaged buildings, lots of damaged roads. But are there other risks associated with earthquakes? Well, yes, there are. Arguably, the next biggest risk is fire. So it's not uncommon during um, an earthquake event for buildings and uh, road systems to become damaged. And this can mean that gas lines can get broken and electrical lines can be damaged, which produces sparks. So it's relatively common when you have large earthquakes for gas lines to fail. Obviously, this means natural gas is being released into the surrounding area. And if there's some kind of spark, it can cause that gas to ignite, obviously leading to a fire. So fire is a very real risk. And of course, in a situation where you have a lot of damaged buildings, there's lots of rubble, which could be flammable. Well, obviously, when a fire starts, it can begin to spread very, very quickly. So you know, fire is a very substantial risk. There's also a significant risk from tsunamis and other forms of flooding. So we've already touched on tsunamis. So this is when a, a very large wave essentially hits the coast and it will force seawater onto on along the coastline that can cause buildings to become flooded. Now, there are also other ways in which areas can become flooded due to earthquakes. So in, uh, imagine a situation where you have a dam, the dam is damaged by an earthquake, and this allows the reservoir behind the dam to essentially break through the dam and allows the water to come flowing downstream. Well, obviously, that's going to cause a very significant flood. There's also the possibility of subsidence. So in the case of subsidence, what's happening is the movement of the fault is bringing down an area of the crust. So imagine you are essentially your house is located on a normal fault and your house happens to be on the hanging wall block. Well, when the normal fault moves, the ground level that your house is on is going to drop down relative to its original position. And so this means the ground on which your house is built has subsided. Now imagine that happens and your house is located on the coast. Well, all of a sudden the ground level drops. Suddenly your ground level is now below sea level. So the sea is now going to flow onto the, onto the land. And of course, it's going to inundate your house. You're going to have flooding. So fire and flood is a very serious risk associated with earthquakes. Now, flooding does also bring another risk, which is um, when flooding occurs in a quite a large way, it can cause the sewage system to fail. 
And of course, this can mean that untreated uh, sewage can enter the floodwaters. And of course, this can lead to waterborne diseases becoming more common. And the presence of all this, uh, uh, all this uh, still water after an earthquake and the associated flooding can also lead to increases in uh, amounts of disease carrying insects such as mosquitoes. So you can see that fire and flooding is a very significant risk to an area after an earthquake. So how do we actually limit the risks of earthquakes? Well, the first thing to remember is geologists cannot predict when an earthquake is going to occur. So no matter how hard we try, we haven't successfully done it. Now, what geologists will do is we will produce hazard maps. So what we'll, as you can see here, we will um, go to an area and we will try to identify all the faults in that area and we will try and work out how likely that fault is to move and obviously produce an earthquake now the way we'll do this very often requires the use of historical data so let's say we have historical data for an area and it says that this fault moves every 50 years so every 50 years there's going to be an earthquake now if we're in a situation where it's been 60 years since the last earthquake, we know that that area is obviously at risk of an earthquake because it's overdue for one. And so we would give that area an increased hazard. Now, if the opposite's the situation, so let's say there was an earthquake two years ago, well, you know, that means we've probably got about another 48 years until the next earthquake. So the risk of an earthquake at that time is relatively low. So geologists will produce these hazard maps and they will be a combination of, you know, how likely is an earthquake to occur? And if an earthquake did occur, you know, what's the likelihood that damage will uh, be likely? So, you know, what's the likelihood that if, you know, if an earthquake does happen, gas lines are going to get broken, what's the likelihood of flooding, etc. And so these hazard maps will allow uh, local government to work out, number one, which areas are most at risk, and number two, come up with a plan to try and mitigate the damage as much as they possibly can. Now, one of the most common ways in which uh, the risks of earthquakes are limited is in improving building design. And so there's lots of things you can do in order to make your building more solid during an earthquake event. So, you know, one of the classic examples is you can increase the amount of steel in your cement. And this will obviously offer your building a much greater degree of stability. You can, you know, increase the, the depth of the foundation that will once again give your building increased stability. There are also some buildings that have been constructed where the foundation is literally built on shock absorbers. So when the earthquake happens, it actually allows the shock absorbers to essentially absorb most of the most of the movement which the earthquake produces and so that allows the building to stay relatively steady and so it's less likely to be damaged now once again this particular uh, method for mitigating earthquake risk is a method which is only really available to countries that have enough money to do this poorer countries unfortunately uh, will often not have the capacity to improve building design in such a way as to increase earthquake resistance and so you know it, it's always helpful when countries that have more resources help out the poorer countries in order to help them improve or should I say reduce the risk of earthquake damage all right, thank you for watching, everybody, and have a good day.